Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name is Meredith Gershenson. I'm a research analyst here at Workforce.com. And today, as the title very well suggests, we're going to talk a little bit about the 2023 hotel industry outlook with the one and only Chip Rogers, AHLA president and CEO. Chip, thank you so much for joining us. I am so honored. Meredith, it is, it is good to be with you. Thanks for having me today. Of course, of course. So the AHLA is the state's only national association uh, dedicated to serving the interests of the entire hotel and lodging industry. And thanks to CHIP's leadership, the AHLA was named as 100 Associations That Will Save the World by the ASAE, quite the sentiment, I must say, and was also honored as the White House's Presidential Award for its Pledge to America's Workers and was recognized as PR Week's Purpose Awards of 2020. So prior to joining the hospitality industry, Chip served in the Georgia General Assembly and he was elected to the office six times and elected twice to serve as a Senate Majority Leader. Again, Chip, thank you so much for coming on. I so appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be with you, Meredith. Thank you. To give everyone a super quick walkthrough on our webinar platform here, we have the chat box to the right. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please throw them in there. I will be happy to tag them and we will have a quick Q&A with Chip. I know we have a, a hard cutoff at uh, the 45 minute mark. So hopefully at the last 10 minutes or so, we'll have the Q&A thrown in. So throw them in there and I'll be happy to get around to those. We also have a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar. They will just slide on the bottom left of your screen. We love to interact with you guys, get any thoughts that you have. So feel free to answer those. And finally, as a handout today, we actually have the AHLA State of the Industry Report from 2023. It pertains greatly to all the topics we're going to talk about. It's an amazing resource. I know I learned a lot from it, and I hope you guys do too. And finally, for those who are looking to be recertified in SHRM or HRCI, we are offering recertification credits in both. Um, we will go over those PDC IDs at the very end at the slides. I will send those out to you guys. And finally, to give a little background on Workforce.com, we are a workforce management software company who specializes in scheduling and time and attendance. And really, our overarching goal at the end of the day is to help business leaders and frontline managers make the best decisions for their company. So without further ado, Chip, I would love to, you know, get some of those general questions out of the way. I would love to um, hear about how you found yourself as the president and CEO of the largest hotel association in the U.S. Well, uh, a lot of good fortune I would start with. Um, <laughs> Fair I um, have had a, a number of interesting careers uh, and one of them, as you alluded to earlier, was working as a public servant. And at the time, um, that I became uh, knowledgeable of some associations in the hotel world I was actually working on legislation uh, dealing with property taxes in my home home state of Georgia. I took on the the, the uh, probably unenviable task of rewriting the state's uh, tax code as it pertains to property taxation. Um, nearing the end of that two year process, um, I had a, a hotel owners group come to me and they were very supportive of what I was doing and and wanted to help make sure the legislation actually made it into law, and it thankfully did. Uh, and we built a relationship at that point in time, and I began um, working with them, consulting with them, and, and, and really helping them um, when they had issues pertaining to anything that dealt with public policy. And <clears throat> we just kind of built a relationship over that time. And once I left politics, I actually went to work for the association, and then a couple years later became the president and CEO. And then uh, going back a little over four, four and a half years ago, uh, AHLA approached me uh, to become the president and CEO of the American Hotel and Lodging Association, and um, and it all seemed to work out great. And so kind of went from a world of public policy, writing and passing public policy, to into the hotel association world, and now I'm um, very blessed to be in a position to, to uh, lead the American Hotel and Lodging Association. How did your experience in public policy translate over to the AHLA? I'm curious. Well, look, we have 32, 33,000 members. Um, when I was in office, I had 225,000 constituents. Um, it's about serving the people um, that were kind enough uh, and believed in you enough to put you in a position of influence. And, and that's the way I looked at my role, both as a public servant and now in, in this particular role, being able to serve an industry that I think is the best industry uh, in the world. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Hospitality is very special. Um, and, and being able to do so in a way that understands the interests of those that you serve and, and how best to arrange those interests in a way, and, and in our case, use the combined effort of the hospitality world uh, to make sure that we're both protecting and promoting hotels. And so uh, I think it, it, it certainly helped me. Um, it also gave me insight, obviously, of understanding what policymakers go through, all the things that they must consider when crafting legislation. Um, and if you haven't sat on that side of the desk, sometimes it's difficult to really understand all that because sure. oftentimes it won't, it won't make great sense to people on the outside saying, well, why are they doing it this way? Uh, but on the inside, there's so many factors from politics to, to uh, you know, working with a governor, to your constituents, to long range implications of the policy and things like that, that, that go into making those type of decisions. For sure. I'm sure there's a lot of transferable aspects that kind of translate over from D.C. to the nationwide aspect of hospitality as a whole. For certain. No question. So I'm curious, you know, I read the um, uh, article that you wrote on Biden's State of the Union address uh, from last month. I, I guess we're actually nearing that full month um, at this point. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, what are your main takeaways from that, you know, how do you think um, it hit in terms of the overall outlook that we're expecting to see in 2023? It, it's look, it's a strange time indeed economically. Um, mm -hmm. And the president is dealing with some president and other elected officials are, are dealing with an economy uh, in a position where we don't have a lot of experience being right here historically. Mm -hmm. So coming out of a pandemic where, um, you know, if you looked at the economic conditions of the country in at the end of 2019, they were the best in all of our lifetime. When you look at interest rates and, and growth in the economy and stock market growth, um, uh, the, the unemployment rate. If you took all of that at the start of 2020, we're, we were in the best position that anyone right. who's alive in the United States had ever been in. Right. And then you hit that cliff and, and you know, so many people lose their job. And we expected the economy to really, you know, pull back a lot. And it didn't as much as we thought. Mm -hmm. And then you had the infusion of all this, all these resources, trillions and trillions of dollars that have now in, in some respect helped create inflation. You had supply chain challenges. And now you're coming out of that. And, you know, the Federal Reserve is trying to get interest rates uh, to a position where it can, as they say, tame inflation because inflation is a, a serious problem. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, you've got, unemployment rates hovering near historic lows. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question of whether we're in a recession or not in a recession, I mean, you can make the argument, depending on what industry you are, you may be in a recession. Our industry is not in a recession. We're still the benefactors of a lot of pent up demand for leisure travel, and we're seeing that. And so you have all of these things happening at once. And then what, what I think kind of lays over the top of all of it, I, it, it and to me, it's the fundamental concern should be of both policymakers and everybody, frankly, in almost every industry. How do we get enough workers in the United States to grow our economy in a way to, to help one grow it, but offset mm -hmm. this massive amount of debt that we've created uh, just in the last few years? Um, that, that's a big, big issue. I had a chance yesterday to, to sit and have lunch with the, <clears throat> the Speaker of the House, and he talked a lot about that, like, you know, the amount of debt we've accumulated just in the last few years. Um, dwarfs anything like the last 50 years combined. And so we've got to tackle that. And we don't have enough people in the United States that are in the workforce. Now, there have been times historically, you know, this thing goes up and down, up and down, but, but rarely did we ever have an occasion where there were more job openings than there were people looking for work mm -hmm. up until recently. And now this trend, and it's measured in the millions of people, this trend is, is continuing month after month after month. There's just not enough people. Right. And so if you, if you want to grow your economy, if you want to grow your GDP, GDP is very simple to determine. It's the number of workers multiplied by their output. That creates the gross domestic product. Well, if you don't have enough people working and your output is actually sadly shrinking recently because worker productivity has gone down, sure. it's going to impact your GDP. So we We've got to have more people. There's just no way around that. And, and they need to be legal. There needs to be a, an orderly process for making this happen. But it must be addressed. And sadly, the, neither the president nor Congress is, is really doing a very good job at, at addressing it. I think it's interesting. You know, a lot of 
what people are responding to in this poll question I sent out asking, what are your biggest concern or concerns coming to 2023? By a long shot, employee retention has been the biggest concern. And it really shadows in terms of the meeting the customer demand, you know, making sure that customer satisfaction is at an all time high and you're deliver delivering that level of service that your, you know, hotel, lodging, resort, whatever it is, is accustomed to and is expectant of. And I think a aspect of retention is so hard because all of this is wrapped up into kind of a circular effect, right? You know, with inflation kind of leading it a little bit, and then it's a top-down effect from there. Yeah, think about, uh, and I try to convey this to policymakers all the time, think about the position of the of the average hotelier in the United States. Mm -hmm. So you, you hit a pandemic where our occupancy went to levels we've never seen before in the industry, historical levels well below what we even saw during the Great Depression back in the sure. 20, late 20s and early wow. 30s. And so you have all these people leave the industry because you don't have customers. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you fast forward to, you know, early 2022, maybe even late stages of 2021. All the customers come flooding back. But now you don't have the workers. So economically, an enormous hole was created. You're just trying to hang on during pandemic, wondering, can I keep myself in business? Now you've got all the customers coming back so you can start making up some of those losses, but you don't have enough people to serve them. And so... Mm -hmm. The worst possible situation you could be in is having to shut down rooms. And that is exactly what was happening for quite some time. You know, we we survey our members on a quarterly basis in May of, of last year, 2022, right there as, as, as summer uh, travel season was beginning. Ninety seven percent of hotels in America had job openings. Forty five percent of those hotels had so many job openings that it was impacting their ability to serve their guests. In other words, rooms are being shut down. Services were being shut down. 45%. Now, from that point then until the most recent survey, it's fa fallen from the upper 90s down to 78%, 79% have job openings. And only only about a quarter have so many job openings that it's impacting their ability to serve their guests. But that's still a quarter of hotels. Sure. And so we're still in a very precarious position in this recovery, which has been regionalized. It's been much healthier in Florida and Texas and Georgia and Arizona than it has in in the Northwest or in Washington, D.C. or in, in Minneapolis. There's, there's all sorts of reasons for that. But overall, the the industry is trying to recover and is only being held back because of the, the, the inability to find and maintain the workforce. Interesting. So I would love to point to this slide, talking a little bit straight from the AHLA 2023 State of the Hotel Industry Report that, again, I will hand out at the very end of the webinar. But you guys laid out some pretty amazing projections coming into 2023 and taking account into Biden's address even. What are some of the challenges that you foresee within the hotel industry taking in these five uh, projections? Well, um, when people make decisions on what hotel to stay at, it's consistently been, there's, there's a whole list and in, in, in we have some of them in, in the report mm -hmm. of what matters. Price and location are always going to matter. Those are going to be the first two. Because if you have to go someplace specifically, right. if you're going to Chicago, you can't go to Cleveland. you got to go to Chicago, right? For sure. And so um, those are always going to be number one and two. But number three now, consistently during the pandemic, and, and it's, it's, it's sustained itself after the pandemic, has been cleanliness. And what is mm. what are the hotels doing to provide that clean and safe environment? And so we fully recognize um, that that is top of mind of consumers both business travelers and leisure travelers and hotels have, have responded. We, you know, early on in the pandemic, we created a safe state program that was able to bring the entire industry together to agree to certain standards of cleanliness and safety. And those have been maintained even post pandemic. And so consumers want that the industry ha has absolutely responded, but we were also forced over the last probably 24 months to, to deal with this surge in, in leisure demand, without having all the employees that are necessary and begin relying on technology. So, mm -hmm. you know, pre-pandemic, I guess the tradition was, for the most part, most hotels, housekeepers, come in at 7 a.m., leave at 3 p.m. You're going to work five days a week, sometimes six days a week. That's not the case anymore. So right. because we're able to better communicate with consumers, we know when people are checking in, we know when people are checking out. In fact, there are many hotels and brands that give 
give bonuses for people that either check in later or check out earlier. And, and, and being able to do that allows you to tailor your workforce, a, a smaller workforce, unfortunately, in many cases, to still be able to address those needs. And so, you know, using AI, using the, the technology to communicate with consumers has been an enormous benefit that has come out of the pandemic and sure. will stay with it for quite some time. What are some ways that you think upper managers, execs can help curb some of these challenges that you've laid out? First and foremost, focusing on the new hires, because if you look mm -hmm. at the turnover rate and sadly our industry um, for almost for eternity, but certainly if you go back the last three years, we have led the nation amongst all industries in the number of people who quit our industry and move on to something else. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them why they're quitting, why are they leaving, why they're leaving? It's because, again, think of yourself in the mind of that hotelier who says, all right, I, I lost all this money. I got to make it up. Now I got, now I have uh, guests who want to stay here. We hire people and we throw them into their job. Right. Go get them. Right. Yeah. Right in the they're deep not, end. <laughs> right. That's right. They're, they're, we're not, they're not easing into the pool. They are right. definitely going off the high dive. And that's not fair to anybody. And it, it leads to greater turnover. And by the way, turnover rates, when, when, when someone turns over our industry, it's usually about a 30% additional cost of having to go through the entire process of hiring the, the lost work productivity while they're gone. And then, of course, um, oftentimes higher wages and then the ramp up period once they get back on. So sure. you, you're not helping yourself by creating an environment where people turn over at this rate. And so if I were giving advice to executives, as tough as it is, mm -hmm. as much as you want to meet that demand right now at the property level, find out a way to have proper training, follow up, shadowing, whatever you got to do. We work with, work with a company called Actable, and they will tell us all the time um, that the three week period, particularly for housekeepers, the mm -hmm. three week period is the time when most folks are saying, I'm either cut out for this or I'm not. And if you can have someone working with them, almost holding their hand, at that three week period, you can start keeping a lot more people who begin to feel valued, begin to understand what their role is, how they can handle their job, working in the environment of, of being on property. All of that is really, really important. And it must happen early in their tenure. And if you gotta get over that hump, you'll be able to keep them for a little bit longer. Yeah, and I think you brought up a really good point. It's not fair for anyone at the end of the day, even the managers who are in charge of that training, they get left holding the bag to an extent. Yeah. And, you know, and we're actually, it's, it's funny you mentioned this, we're actually doing a lot of research currently on the manager burnout rates that we're seeing. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about employee retention, frontline staff, you know, those who are working the floor and how the engagement levels are just plummeting and turnover is happening, you know, all that great stuff in between. And managers are the ones who are actually experiencing the most amount of burnout out of all of them. So it's it's so interesting to see the middleman really struggling the most. Yeah, you know, think about it. Like as a kid, I worked at McDonald's, right? And when mm -hmm. I worked at McDonald's, you started typically back in those days, started working the grill. And then once you kind of master that, they might put you at the, at the register. And if, if you master that, you might go to, you know, assistant GM and, and, and work your way up to a GM. Mm -hmm. Think about that GM now having to go all the way back and start working the grill again. It's the same thing happening in hotels. Right. You, know, you start at, at, at one level. Now you're running the whole hotel. And during the pandemic, you lost everybody. You're actually in there making up rooms like GMs are working as housekeepers. Yeah. And at some point, they're like, all right, maybe this isn't the industry for me because I thought I had moved up the ladder and I felt like I went right back down. Right. Oh, that's so true. Now, the, the problem is, look, <laughs> We're painting it. I don't want this painted as a negative picture because I remind people all the time. I, I probably do an inter, a minimum of one interview a day. Mm -hmm. Right now in the hotel industry, the wages that we're paying are higher than they've ever been. And what frustrates me to no end are policymakers who characterize hotel workers from a wage standpoint the same way that they would somebody working in a fast food restaurant. Now, right. fast food restaurant wages have gone up, but they're still hovering around you know, $11, $12, $13 an hour. Average wage in the hotel industry right now is $23 an hour. You can get starting wages even higher than that. And so <clears throat> wages are higher than they've ever been. Benefits are better than they've ever been. Flexibility is better than it's ever been. But the most important thing is that if you think about what has happened during the 
the, the, the fall into the pandemic and the rise out of it. So many people left the industry. It's created enormous gaps of opportunity. Mm. And so if you're out there thinking, all right, where can I get a good job to build a career? There's no better place than the hospitality industry right now. You're going to start at a good wage. You're going to have good benefits. You're going to have flexibility. And if you can stick it out for a little bit, you're going to begin climbing that ladder rapidly because so many people have left the industry. That perfectly segues actually into our next slide, talking a little bit about the worker shortage, right? And how and if operation managers can get ahead of the worker shortage, how is this possible? You know, in other words, how can they make most the most of the team that they currently have on staff without completely burning them out on both ends? Well, you got to recognize what people need. You know, if you're still mm -hmm. stuck in, you know, housekeepers from seven to three, not understanding uh, their life outside of being a housekeeper, if you're still paying them once every two weeks instead of what mo what so many companies are going to, you know, daily pay. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to look at ways to help provide transportation and things like that, they're going to leave because others are in fact doing that. Not just other hotels, but other industries are doing that as well. And so. You really have to focus right now on what are the needs of those employees? Mm -hmm. What is it they like doing? What is it that they don't like doing? Um, just as we said earlier, handing them the keys to the cart and saying, have at it. That, that is a recipe for turnover. Right. And as, we, as we've documented, turnover is extremely expensive. Now, as an industry, you know, the way we look at it at HLA, just so you understand, because we, we advocate every day for this industry to, to people at the city level, county level, state level, federal level. There's a pie of workers in America right now today. Mm -hmm. You could argue that pie is either stagnant or shrinking, but it's probably not growing because workforce participation rate is down. People are entering the workforce later. People are leaving the workforce earlier. And so that pie is there. And all these industries are fighting over that pie right now. And so what we're trying to do is convince someone, hey, working in our industry is better than working in that other industry over there. And so you as, a, as an employer, you need to think about that. We're fighting these other industries for a limited number of people. That's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation that we're working on is how do we get more people into the country so that they can work, legally work? That's what we're looking for. There, there are jobs. There are people that don't live in the United States who would love to come here and work, whether it's on a temporary basis or a permanent basis. How do we create a structured way to grow that pie, right? Mm -hmm. So- Fighting over our part of the pie is, is number one. Growing the pie is number two. And that's how we, that's how we conceptualize what we're doing in and around workforce. Um, and it keeps us up at night. People say, what is it that keeps you up at night? It's like, right. how am I going to grow that pie and get a larger piece of it? Yeah, that's an interesting outlook, actually. Never considered expanding out the market that we're choosing from, in a sense, opposed to right fighting over it and making sure okay, how can I keep the team I have without letting anyone go or without, you know, having any turnover, whether it's due to burnout, loyalty, whatever it might be. Right. It's such an interesting outlook. And would that feed into the immigration reform that you guys are working on? You know, I've read a lot about that on your site. I would love to hear how that feeds into it a little bit. Yeah. So look, there, there, we, again, uh, we try to be very uh, simplistic in what we're doing, even though these mm -hmm. are not simple issues. Right. <laughs> in communicating what it is. Confused, right. Yeah. <laughs> What it is we're trying to, to accomplish. So separate guest workers from mm -hmm. immigration, because by definition, immigration is someone who's coming to permanently reside in the United States. So A, we focus on guest workers. How can we grow the current guest worker program that is that's statutory limited to right around 130,000 of the H-2B visas, which many people in our, in, in our industry use. And mm -hmm. that 130,000 is only when the president doubles it. Uh, which is the most that he can he uh, can possibly do. And so we're looking at ways to find more guest workers. Those are people who come here for a limited time and then return home that can work in our industry. There's a lot of ways we're attacking that. I won't go into all the details, but we, we do say guest workers are a part of the solution. Probably the larger part of the solution is being able to look at this from an economy that says, all right, we're at historic low levels of unemployment. We have millions of jobs that are literally unfilled right now. More right. people, more jobs than there are people. And how do we bring in enough people safely, orderly, legally to into the United States who want to permanently reside here to take those jobs? Recognizing we may not always be in this position. Unemployment may go back up at some point. And at that point, 
then you stop bringing in additional people, right? It's not, it, it, it's simple, but it's not easy to, to make happen. And politically, it's extremely difficult to make happen. But if we have a system that can properly control this to say, at time periods like this, where there's high, high demand for workers and not enough workers in our economy, how are we bringing in people? And at times when there's too many workers, where Americans are looking for work and there are not enough jobs, restrict people. Yeah. It's, it, that's the way the system should work. Yeah. That, I mean, it's it's fluctuation, right? And that's just yeah. the nature of the economy, the labor market, everything that our country is kind of built off on. It thrives off volatility, for sure. Yes. Uh, I would love to go back to your address on the State of Union address. What can you tell me about resort fees specifically and the impact that they would have on hotels? And more so than that, why is transparency within these fees so important within the hotel industry? Look, we got lumped in with a lot of folks that I think, I mean, if you, if you think about what well, the president calls them junk fees, mm. unfortunately, some of the information that he passed along um, we know not to be accurate. We, we attempt to work with his team and say, look, if we're going to talk about the issue, let's mm -hmm. get actual facts out there. This idea of $90 resort fees is, ju is just not accurate. Setting that aside for a moment, as all consumers, we see fees sometimes that we don't like. I don't like all the taxes that are thrown on a, on a bill. Like sure. when, I, when I stay at a, at a hotel in, in New York, there's probably seven line items of taxes. I wish he would attack those as well. But when you look at these fees, it's one thing to buy a ticket to a concert and recognizing that you're paying an exorbitant fee for what amounts to nothing more than an electronic transaction. There's not a human being sitting there pushing buttons. No one's having to work extra. It's literally just an electronic transaction. That's on one side of the spectrum. On the other side, we'll use hotels, for example. It's important to remember only about 6% of the hotels in the United States charge anything like a resort fee. Mm. And there's always something of value attached to that fee, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's a, a chair at, 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 the, at the beach or at the pool, whatever it is, there's something of value that goes into that. Now, people ask, well, okay, well, what if I'm not going to use that? Mm -hmm. Understand the economics of it. If you only charge the people that are going to use it, the cost is going to be exorbitantly high. Sometimes when I go to a resort, I use the beach chairs. Sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I check into a hotel, most of the time now, I'm using the Wi-Fi. Other times I don't. Whatever. I, I was at a resort uh, at an event this past weekend. They offered the ability to go out and see the dolphins. You could get on a boat. That was one of the things they offered in staying there. Right. I would love to do that. I've done that. I didn't have the time to do it at that particular time, but I would have loved to have done that. If you only charge the people that are using it at that time, the cost is going to be too high to even be able to provide some of those services. But if you even it out and it's a fee that is across all guests, mm -hmm. then it becomes a reasonable amount and people can avail themselves to it and have a better experience. Now, you may agree or disagree with the process of being able to, to charge that, but there is something of value attached to those fees. The question is, during the booking process, how do we represent those fees in a way that people aren't surprised when they see right. them? And so what we're saying is, look, if you're in the lodging space, and that is the hotel, an online travel agency, uh, a short-term rental, short rental company, mm -hmm. you need to put all of those uh, costs up front so when the consumer looks at the price from the very beginning, they can understand it. But that transparency needs to apply to all of us. We can't just have it in spots where this part of the industry is required to do it. Other parts of the industry are not required to do it. Mm -hmm. We're in favor of that, that, that across the board transparency so people understand what it is they're paying for. I think it also becomes a lot more digestible, especially in a post-COVID world where now, even on our restaurant checks, we're used to seeing a service charge and a certain percentage dedicated, hey, this is for the entire staff that's working, not just those that are serving your food. You know, it's the guys in the kitchen. It's people who are working after hours. It's whatever it is. And I think it's a lot more digestible when it's something that is a little more expected in this post-COVID world. And, you know, I'm curious what has response been on the guest side of things for those who are receiving these, um, you know, 
uh, resort fees at the end of their stay? Has it been something that's been, okay, this is something I can accept, or has it been, we're up in arms over this, this is absurd? Yeah, so what's interesting, again, facts are, are as, as people often say, facts are your friends. Mm. Fact is only about 6% of hotels even charge anything like this. But I was talking to an owner who does run a lot of resorts, and he's in some inner cities where, they, where the city has mandated that they charge an additional amount to cover healthcare costs or something for the employees. Mm-hmm. He was telling me he added some of that to his bill as a line item. And after like six months, he said, never had a single person complain about it. No. Wow. They all looked at it and said, okay, I understand that. Because yeah. it was descriptive. They understood the money was going to the employees and they didn't have a problem with it. So I think transparency absolutely does work. Sure. Are you going to have people who say, I just don't want to pay for that. That's wrong. There's, there's no question. That is going to happen. But you're in a much better position telling everybody up front and dealing with those few who don't want to pay it as opposed to attempting to not tell people what it is. And then they find out about it. And that's when you have an angry customer. Mm-hmm. I would love to turn more towards some of the advocacy work. And we touched on some of it early on and specifically the pro act that you guys have been working on. This is directly from the AHLA website for those who do want to check it out, but I would love to, t- for you to first and foremost, talk some of, about some of the advocacy work that the HLA doing is in light of workforce development and why this work is so important at the end of the day. Well, and, and real quickly, I do have a time check. I, I probably a hard stop around 1140. I've got to be, okay. <laughs> on a form of transportation that won't wait on me at exactly. No then. worries. No worries. We'll uh, be sure to get you out of here. Yeah. So uh, look, pro act is dealing with organized labor. It's kind of what we would, we characterized as the, the, the Christmas tree wish list of every bad organized labor idea of the last 35 years put into one bill. Mm-hmm. Um, it, th- there are so many terrible things in here, like getting rid of, of, um, of, of secret ballots to the worst case example here is eliminating all right to work states in the United States. Now, this thing would be challenged constitutionally uh, with the federal government trying to step in and tell the states you can't even have a right to work state. But it is a a brazen attempt at total unionization. And uh, hopefully it'll it'll never come to pass in the United States. Uh, It would be terrible for workers, be horrible for our economy, really bad for consumers. Mm -hmm. Um, So for those of us who fly all the time, if you want uh, every hotel to become like the, the TSA agents, that's what you get with, with this type of legislation. Sure. Or if you prefer hotels to be private sector, like clear people that work for clear, who are oftentimes very, very helpful, that, that, that's almost the best analogy I can make. This is just a terrible, terrible idea. Right. And, and look, we, this is one example of what we do every day. Like, this is a f- piece of federal legislation that we mm-hmm. fight against uh, here in Washington, D.C., but we work with our partners at the state and local level um, to fight for or against legislation every single day. I've got people in the field right now today working at state capitals all across the country on legislation that impacts hotels. Um, wow. I've probably got like a dozen states that are considering legislation in and around short term rentals. I've got states dealing with this crazy idea called predictive scheduling that is highly damaging for both the, the employee and the employer. And so we're out there in the field working on these things um, every day uh, to mm-hmm. try to protect the industry. So that feeds me into my next question perfectly. Tell me about some of the legislation HL, H, AHLA is supporting and how others might be able to get involved, you know, those in the audience who are working in the hospitality industry. Well, let's start with the second part first. Mm-hmm. The reality is, is we're only as strong as the unity that our industry has. And so if we're bifurcated, or if you have certain parts of the industry that care about this and other that care about that, and no one's coming together, uh, it's just going to weaken all of us. And so AHLA's main function is to bring everybody together to stand behind these ideas and these policies that help everybody. And so um, this is free, and it's my only ask t- today. Go to hotelsact.org and sign up. It takes yeah. about 60 seconds to sign up. It allows you to become part of our grassroots army. This allows you to be in direct contact with lawmakers at every level delivering the message of the industry. And we write the messages for you. You don't have to do anything other than click yes. So mm-hmm. hotelback.org is, is, is my only ask. And then you will see issues. I'll, I'll go back to the short-term rental issue. 
um, making sure that our industry, that the playing field is level for everybody. You know, this idea that you have a hotel on one street corner and then across the street, you have a condominium building in which half the units are being rented out on a daily basis through short term rentals, essentially acting and performing exactly like the hotel across the street. Mm -hmm. When those two businesses are competing against each other and yet their rules are completely different for each one, that's not a fair and level playing field. Right. right? And so we have to make sure that if you're in the lodging industry, we're all ready to compete. I mean, Marriott competes with Hilton and Hyatt and IHG. I mean, they all compete every day and that's fine because they're all playing by the same rules. Right. But if you have people that aren't playing by those rules, that's what we need to guard against and to promote a fair, uh, a, a, a fair and effective um, playing field for everybody. And so that's just one issue that mm -hmm. we would be working on in, in a number of states. And so we take those issues that affect the entire industry. We get behind them. We try to unify the industry. And then we need the grassroots messaging of people that are on the ground in the in the actual districts of the uh, of the lawmakers so that their voices can be heard. And that's that's what we do every single day. I think that's so important. You know, I asked the question in the polls, how involved are you when it comes to policy support or following legislation involving the hotel industry? And we were getting a couple of different responses. Some are saying none. Some are saying very within the local, state and federal level. And at the end of the day, I mean, it really is supporting that level playing field that you're talking about. So I think that's such a good point. I would love to quickly touch on um, a couple of questions. Uh, we got one from Heiko. He's, he said, uh, would there be a possibility to, to extend the J-1 visa student program from one year to two years? This would help us fill some labor deficient gaps. It's a great idea. We will add it to our list of requests. Um, mm -hmm. I will tell you, every time we go into the work visa arena and try to make uh, what we would call progress, for example, we're working on legislation right now that would have you returning workers not count against the cap. So if somebody came in to work for you one year, the next year they wouldn't count against your cap or the overall cap. We mm -hmm. think that's extremely beneficial. Um, we are met with opposition by organized labor. Organized labor doesn't like these work visa programs. And right now, organized labor has an outsized influence on this administration. And so it's very difficult in those negotiations to get any changes whatsoever. But that is an excellent, excellent suggestion. And I probably have time for one more. Yeah, definitely. We have a question from Carolina. She asked, how much would you say our operational success is down to us working on the front lines versus what our current administration may or may not be doing according to the address? According to what? Again, what was the, the last one? Uh, State of the Union address, I believe, is what she's referencing. Uh, I don't know that I fully understand the question, but I, I will say, look, the lifeblood of our industry, and if we've ever doubted it, we certainly saw it coming out of the pandemic, are the people that work at those of us in the industry, I, I don't work at a hotel, but those in the industry who are greeting guests and providing true hospitality. Mm. We don't want to become a commodity. Going to a hotel is very special. Whether it's a business trip or you're going there for a family reunion or a wedding or a graduation, these are the moments that impact your lives in a very positive way. <clears throat> we want to make sure that our industry is always meeting those demands and exceeding those demands of guests. And that is through human to human interaction. We can't do it all on these devices. They right. help, but it is human to human interaction. So that's what our industry is really about. It's hospitality. And so if we've ever learned a lesson during this pandemic is that person that works at the hotel, engaging with guests in whatever way they do um, is absolutely critical to the future of this industry. Without, without those people and that mentality of providing hospitality, we don't exist. And so um, you can't really even overstate the value of people that work on the front lines. Definitely. What a great note to end on.